Yeah, good morning everyone. Welcome back. I hope you uh, rested a bit and was not busy with Rana's task all night long. <laughs> um, this morning I want to talk a bit on, uh, maybe I should turn the lights off here. This morning I want to talk a bit on um, thermo optical effects in laser crystals. And um, uh, so, so I, I already mentioned a couple of things like with these two different stability ranges and that there might, some, might be some thermal lensing involved. But today I want to go a bit deeper into this um, uh, topic and I want to show you the effects which occur not only in the advanced LIGO laser but um, also in other end pumped systems or actually also in side pump pumped systems but um, uh, I'm going to talk about this uh, configuration which we have for advanced LIGO but that's not the only uh, system where that um, applies to. Then I in particular uh, want to talk a bit about aberrations and show you a bit in a more detail how this um, how this thing with this working point of the PSL works with the fundamental mode um, that occurs then. And um, in the last part of this session, I've a couple of, um, I call it attempts for optimization of the PSL laser crystals. So, um, and, and I can already tell you that uh, none of these things are really present in the PSL, but I want to show you the experiments which we did on that, things we tried to improve, and how it came out, why it works and why it not works. Uh, so um, that might be a bit longish. I have a lot of uh, slides here, so Santa, if you don't stop me from talking, I will just go through that. But uh, if, if it's going to be too longish, then please interrupt me so I, I can easily just skip one or more of these um, things. Okay, just as a reminder, um, I talked um, in the last sections about this high-power oscillator, which also runs as a as a free-running laser, so it's a ring laser with an outcoupling mirror here, and then the ring goes, is, is closed through these four crystals. And if you just keep that as a free-running system without having any injection locking or so, then it's basically a laser by its own, which emits two beams. One is coupled out here, and the other one is blocked somewhere behind this thin film polarizer here in this uh, high-power Faraday isolator. And one of the key points of this, um, does this work? Yeah. One of the key points of this uh, system are these, what we call pump heads. Uh, I've shown this picture before, but I want to remind you. So that's what we call a pump head. We have some pump light coming somehow from here via a fiber coupled diode that's sent through this glass rod, the homogenizer, some diagnostics, and then it's imaged into this crystal. And I want to focus on um, things that happen inside this, this crystal. So today I, I'm going to talk about uh, what's going on here. <coughs> So let's start with an overview on um, thermo-optical effects. And uh, um, I, I made this little um, graphic here, which I always thought is pretty handy to get an overall view on, on what's happening there. And then we're going to focus on several points. So we have some optical pumping. We, we put some uh, light from laser diodes into the crystals. So that's a pump light. And it has a wavelength of 808 nanometers. The laser light is emitted at 1064 nanometers, so there's a gap in between that. And um, that energy gap which occurs creates basically heat. So there's some um, uh, decay from the upper laser level. Some, some, uh, uh, basically everything that's left is that's called the quantum defect, so that's um, converted into heat. And then there might be also some other um, uh, paths which create some additional heat. So um, we have a fraction of at least 26% of the pump light, which is basically going to, to, uh, yeah, to, to heat. So that causes a temperature change. And uh, that temperature change causes some um, deformation inside the crystal. So you have the thermal expansion. It's basically what I guess everybody knows. So um, that, that deforms the crystal. And via the el elasto-optic tensor, so that's a material uh, property of neodym yak. Uh, you end up in getting stresses in, in the crystal. And then what, what can happen is what everybody might guess. So if you put, for, ex for example, I don't know, a soldering iron to a, to a water glass or so, then that thing will break. And that's what can ha easily happen with a neodym yak crystal. So the fracture limit for these crystals, as I pointed out earlier, is about 130 megapascal. So that's kind of the, the lower number, but 
people haven't investigated that too well. That's, at least that's my feeling. So there are different numbers depending on, on the book where you look at. So um, we were trying to take care of that by having this low doped crystal with this um, pump light double pass such that the temperature peaks which occur inside the crystal are as low as possible. And at the same, same time, we want to absorb as much uh, pump light as possible. So we, we try to take care of this fracture limit. Another effect that might happen is that um, if, if the crystal itself expands, then that additional material, so to say, has to go somewhere. So what that causes is that the end phases of the crystal start to deform. So they, they deform really like a, like a very, very thick lens, so to say. Um, and that, that in, indeed causes a, um, a lens, which you might call a thermal lens. And um, uh, there are more effects in that than just so this one is sort of easy. So we can take care of that by having this undoped end caps, which you might have seen in one of the, the pictures I've shown before. So you have the doped neodymium react crystal, which acts as the active material. And then there are undoped end caps, just yak on both ends of the crystal, which um, are actually diffusion bonded. So that's a technique which really ensures that they don't just fall off if there's some, some deformation occurring. And in fact, that seems to work pretty well. I've never seen a crystal which breaks right at this boundary between the doped and the undoped region. Um, so this undoped material helps to, to limit this bulging of the uh, crystal end phases. And so we can forget about this part. part. What we can't forget about is uh, that this deformation uh, also causes a change in the refractive index via the photoelastic effect. And um, the, a change in the refractive index also means that you get some sort of thermal lensing here. And that's something we just have to live, live with. So um, uh, we will learn later today that this thermal lens is not like a perfect lens. It has some, some aberrations, mainly spherical aberrations. And um, since we can't get rid of that effect, we just Treat it as a normal lens. So it's a lens which depends on the, on the heat you generate in the crystal, or the, the um, um, refractive power of that lens depends on the heat that you put into the crystal. And of course, it changes, um, uh, it causes a, a change of the stability range of the laser. So um, if, you, if I can remind you on this picture I've shown before with these two stability pots, and they, of course, depend on, on this lens. So it's just treated as a normal lens for the, for the time being. And you have another effect that's caused by the refractive index and um, the, uh, the refractive index change. And that is that um, the refractive index doesn't change equally in all directions. So it's not really isotropic. And that means that, that you end up with some biofringent. So what that means is basically that you have different um, indices of refraction for, for um, different polarization uh, components. Like, for example, the tangential component, if you look at the crystal, and the radial part. And they have different uh, indices of refraction. So that's called biofringence. And that causes a B-focusing of the beam. So you have different foci for different polarizations. And it also causes some depolarization. So we were talking about the fact that we have a linearly polarized beam in the beginning somehow. And uh, we will see in a couple of minutes that uh, this effect causes that, that small less destroyed. So that causes losses. And um, also, um, yeah, of course, it uh, affects the, the shape of the beam that's coming out of the laser. So let me start with the thermal lensing. Um, uh, almost everybody I know who started with uh, laser development or who's working with lasers tries to investigate that at least in solid state laser physics. And there are so many papers on that. And everybody tries to measure it. Everybody wants to know what that thermal lens is, because it's really important if you de de want to design a laser with certain, certain properties. So um, I want to, oh no, I first have this, um, this slide, which actually explains the, the effects a bit uh, more in the detail. So the pump light is, as I said, partly converted into, into heat. So that's coupled in here. That's kind of what this picture shows. And um, as I said, the, the barrel of the crystal is, is uh, circumvented by cooling water. So we try to keep that cool to not accumulate this, um, this heat here. 
And uh, if we want to start with some simulations, it's always easy to just put some assumptions in. And the assumptions I want to make for the beginning is um, that, that we kind of have an homogeneous um, heat generation, so if you will, a homogeneous pumping. And I'm, I, I think it's, um, it's an assumption I'm allowed to have. So we have a very low doped crystal, and that means that the absorption right in the beginning of the crystal is not too high, so there is at the next increment, um, if you cut that in slices, there's still some pump light left, so I can just assume, okay, that's, that's homogeneous over the length of the crystal. First order, I mean, I know it's not completely true, but um, let, let's assume that for the, for the moment. And um, uh, the second uh, assumption I want to make is that this crystal is, has an infinite length, basically. Um, well, the, the diameter of this crystal is normally something like three millimeters. The length of the dope crystal uh, crisp, uh, section is something like 40 millimeters. So I would say that's close to infinite. Um, and if we do this assumptions, then we can come up with this very uh, simple time independent um, heat conduction equation, which basically says that the gradient of the temperature in either x, y, z, or if you want, rad if you want to use um, uh, radial coordinates, you can pick the, the radius and then some angle, equals uh, um, the negative thermal energy divided by the conductivity. So that's the uh, equation you have to uh, somehow have to solve. <coughs> and um, well, the solution of this equation is something like you, you have a steady state temperature distribution along the radial axis. So we assume that there is no heat flux going in that direction because it's uh, uniformly pumped. So um, you get some steady state temperature distribution along the radial um, action here because, uh, axis here because you have the pumping middle and then the cooling at the barrel. And it turns out that that has more or less a um, parabolic shape. So you end up with a parabolic temperature distribution over the, the um, uh, uh, crystal cross section. And that means that you also have a parabolic um, change in refractive index um, across this section. So I noted down this um, equation, which looks rather simple. So right in the middle, or if you have no pumping, then then you have a certain index of refraction. So that's a number that you look up in a, in a book or somewhere in the literature. And then you have this correction factor here, which goes with the, um, with the radius. And the complicated part is actually this gamma here, because there are a lot of things that are going in. It's material properties. It's, of course, a pump power, because that gives you how much uh, heat is really generated. It, it depends on the doping concentration. It depends on on uh, the, the pump light spectrum. So if you really pump at only one wavelength or if your pump light spectrum maybe has a certain width or so. So uh, it, it mainly um, depends on the created heat. So that's all, all these parameters go in the end into the created heat. And that means that you end up with a lens, which is in the first order a real spherical lens, which, uh, which refractive power rises linear with the pump power. OK, now you can do the simulations. But as I said, there are so many uncertainties that people normally want to measure that. And I want to show you a couple of um, tries on how we try to investigate how big this thermal lens is. And uh, the thing which is at least um, most obvious to me is, um, well, we use a test laser. In this case, it's, um, it's a laser diet. And that laser diet should have a really good beam profile. So it's, in this case, it was one of the DFB diets I was talking about um, earlier. So it has a really round beam profile. It looks kind of similar as the NPRO beam. But the wavelength is a bit different because uh, you don't want to have any amplification here. So you don't want to have any lasing effect. You just want to use it as a test beam. So you collimate this beam here. And then you send it, send it through the uh, pumped crystal. And you assume that um, over the crystal, there's this thermal lens somehow occurring. So the thermal lens would focus down that beam. So the most natural thing you can do is um, you have a certain pump power, and then you scan a CCD camera or a photodiode or something through the beam and investigate what, where the focus of that beam is. And that would give you the focal length of, of, of your crystal. And if you do that, so you, you pick different pump powers. You look where the spot here is. And then you uh, actually take this distance as the focal length. And then you take the inverse of that. And that would give you the refractive power. Then you would end up with a nice linear curve, which 
sort of looks like that, and that gives you some information of like, okay, the thermal refractive power is something like um, this number, 0 0.027 dioptries per watt in this case. Well, that's, an, that's actually the slope of this curve. So if you take this, um, this, this curve here, so you can calculate the thermal refractive power from the focal length here. So it's just the inverse. And if you just take the slope, then you can say, OK, I end up with something like, well, let's say 0.5 per a certain amount of pump power. And that actually, if, if you do this um, division, then it actually gives you this, this number here. However, it's a kind of a complicated setup. So you, you need a test laser, you need a CCD camera, you need to hook this thing up. And what um, my favorite method in measuring that is, is, is a bit different. And that goes over the laser stability. So if you, um, um, so, so there are certain ways to look at something like laser stability. And one is, for example, to pick this G parameters. The G parameters give you some information on at which regions that laser is stable and in which not. And it con they, they consist mainly of, um, of geometrical things on how you set up your thing. So if you have a system like this, you have one crystal, two plane mirrors, and a lens somewhere in between. And you have all these distances, which I um, draw here. Then this, this G parameter here is something like 1 minus this length divided by the focal length of the lens. And this G parameter is this length, uh, 1 minus this length divided by the focal length of, of this length. And um, <clears throat> well, um, well I, I don't want to derive it, but a laser is, is always uh, stable if the, uh, the product of these two G parameters here is, um, is between 0 and 1. And that's this uh, wide region which is shown here. So the, in the gray region, this product is not between 0 and 1. So in this case, for example, um, uh, G1 is negative. So the whole product is negative, And that's why that's instable. Here you have the same thing for G2. And here the, the product is, is um, just bigger than, than 1 in these two cases. So what happens if you have two mirrors, an active medium in between with a the thermal lens? <coughs> Excuse me. And um, you start pumping that system, so the thermal lens is kind of growing, and the system is symmetrically. You start somewhere here at 1, 1, and then you move uh, through the origin, and you move through all this stable region here, and then you end up somewhere in the instable region. So that's kind of the, the this, uh, if, if I can remind you of these curves of the beam radius, that's kind of the symmetric case where you don't have any split between the two stability pots. However, if that uh, resonator is slightly asymmetric, then that curve shifts a bit down. So what happens is you move from here through this instable region, and then it becomes stable again. So these two uh, wide regions here are kind of the two pots I've shown you before. And if you look at the output power, then you will see that you walk through this instable region. So if you look at the output power versus the pump power, you might see this dip. And exactly at uh, where this dip occurs, so exactly is, is this part here, so I'm drawing this circle here because it's kind of unclear which position exactly is meant. At that point, you can calculate the thermal lens um, with this formula. And the result you get out of that is a, are a bunch of curves, actually. So, so the advantage, so let me say that, the advantage of this method is that you don't need any test laser, you don't need any, any camera. You just hook up your asymmetric resonator, crank up the pump power, and, and look at the output power. And that gives you some information on, on how that um, thermal lens behaves. And if you do so for different resonator lengths, then you end up with these curves. And it, actually, they don't really look like this curve here with this nice, sharp dip. They look a bit different. And there are many reasons for that. One is, for example, that this curve is kind of, an, um, kind of an, a nice case of a really fundamental mode beam. But if you just um, go ahead and build a laser like that, then it's not like this nice round beam profile. There's just something. And the fundamental mode might be in it. So that's why you have this thing. And also, an, an asymmetric resonator doesn't mean automatically that there's no laser light coming out. So it's kind of difficult to uh, make any assumptions from these curves. Um, for the analysis, which is shown on this side, so it's kind of the same, a similar curve as what I've shown before. 
I use this uh, data points with the circles around it and as you can see it's more or less an estimate on which point do I pick. I mean I could also pick this one or something here or so but I, I picked the ones with the red well and, well, and in, in, in this case I decided well let's leave that one out because it's to me not that obvious whether I want to pick something here or you know it's not really going down so but with this method it, it's a simple method it's a not very accurate method but it gives you some good idea how the thermal refractive power uh, looks like in this case it's a bit lower than in the first case and the reason might be that um, I mean I, I will point out that later but the reason might be that it's a multi-mode beam so you don't have this really special certain diameter uh, test beam in this case. Another method um, uh, might be to use a wavefront sensor and I've seen that you have this really nice experiment going on in one of the labs so uh, I don't uh, I, I mean I've I have another slide on, on, on this later on, but I don't want to comment too much on it because I'm just assuming that you all read the instructions, so you basically know how it works. But the, the basic way how it, how it goes is you have a CCD chip somewhere, you have a lens array right in front of it, and um, uh, each point at the CCD array is, is kind of correlated to uh, one of these lenses. So you have, have this array and you have each, each of this lens that has a certain focal length and that would create a spot somewhere here. Now, so if you come with a randomly or may, maybe not even randomly but somehow shaped um, wave front, then, the, then this, um, then this uh, tangential segments here would, would cause that uh, you're not coming plane on this uh, or perpendicular to this uh, lens array here um, uh, into the device but at some sort of angle and that causes a displacement of these spots which can then be monitored and then you can do this analysis and uh, try to um, try, try to describe the wavefront with a with a bunch of polynomials or yeah you basically need a, a, a complete orthogonal set of um, of components if you, um, you pick something like the Zernike uh, uh, polynomials for that and people, people do that because uh, each of these Zernike polynomials describe a, a certain kind of aberration, which is kind of nice to know. So it's, um, yeah, well, you can take it as a lucky coincidence that each polynomial correspond to some sort of aberration. So that gives you some description here. And especially in this case, that's very nice because there's one coefficient for the defocus term. And if you, if you grab the coefficient, so if you, if you grab the number which tells you how big this term is in the overall wave front, then you can use that to get an idea on the, um, on the um, thermal refractive power. Um, and again, there's this set, set up with a test laser which you send through the crystal and then you do an, oh, well, the, well, actually in this case you need a, um, some sort of imaging system which image the wavefront um, uh, uh, sensor picture to the end phase of the crystal and then you do this analysis which I described before and then again you end up with a curve like that which tells you something about the thermal refractive power. Um, in this case it's, uh, it's the one where one has to put the most effort in because as soon as the table starts shaking or something is not well allowed, uh, aligned you have this huge deviation so you have to take kind of take the mean value and um, that actually gives you a, this kind of inaccurate curve but yeah that was a question well yeah I mean in the in the in in this first case here which I've shown you in this case I've drawn this drawn it like this and for this curve I was assuming that the thermal lens is at a position where the, the peak temperature occurs. That's not really accurate. It's not really right to do that. What you normally need to do is, is you have to look at the principal plane. The principal plane is a plane for, for each lens or each optical system where you can assume that all the refractive index change, everything what's, what's, what a lens is doing is happening in that plane. And there's a formula how you can calculate that. And then you can take this plane is sort of the position where your thin lens um, sits. In the real world, however, it looks a bit different because it's a really thick lens in this case and it has a very complicated shape. But if you want to 
do some simple uh, math, then you probably want to go with this um, with this plane. Okay, thanks for the question. Um, all right, so let's go on with some. Well, I've, I've I've shown you how it works, and as I pointed out, the easiest way for me, at least, is to just crank up the pump power, look how the how the output power behaves, and then just take that as a rough number. It's not that accurate anyway. Yeah. It it doesn't it doesn't and I think the reason is that there are several modes competing here, so the second stability range is really a pot for the fundamental, and then as we will see in a couple of slides, the higher order modes are also pots, but they are kind of shifted. So, yeah. So some you don't some you don't catch. Some might have a different overlap. Some might don't not, do not even fit into the resonator. So uh, way out here. At, at really high pump powers with this configuration, the laser is always instable because the lowest mode that can oscillate in that thing is so huge that it doesn't even fit into the into the gain medium. Yeah. Right. So it's it's kind of a not very accurate uh, thing, but it at least tells you like something like okay, at 200 watts of pump power, I, I have about 200 millimeters of focal length. But of course, that depends on the laser mode radius. It depends on how your pump light is really distributed. I mean, I was talking about this homogeneous pump light distribution and so on. But in the real world, that's all not really true. It just gives you an idea on how to start with the layout of an optical resonator. OK. So another effect that occurs is biofringence. And I've, I've kind of taken this picture here from that Kirchner book. So if, you, if you've never seen a laser from inside and you've never built one, then you might want to start with this book. Um, I mean, it, it's not the standard book. That's a book by Siegmann, I think. But that really gives you a quick idea on what's going on. And there is a section on, um, on uh, um, the thermal, thermal optical effects. And he came up with this kind of really nice uh, picture of what's going on. So let me repeat that. Biofringence means if you have a crystal which kind of looks like that, and the crystal cut direction, the, the crystallographic cut direction goes in, in this direction here. <clears throat> and then you look to the, to the front of the crystals. And you can describe the um, uh, index of refraction for the, different, um, for, the, for the different directions. Actually, in this case, it's the radial uh, direction and this tangential component here. You can describe that as a refractive index ellipsoid, what, where different parameters go in, and then you can actually do some calculations. So if you have this neodymium crystal, then you will figure out it's a cubic crystal, and um, it's, it's isotropic. So if, if you look at this picture, you grab your crystal, you have a look at the refractive index, and you would find out that this, um, this ellipse here is actually a circle. doesn't matter where you are, here or here, it's always a circle. And that situation starts to change once you start to put some heat into the material because then the refractive index, um, or actually the, the change in the refractive index, which is caused by the heat, uh, is different for this direction and that direction. So this thing really starts to become an ellipse. And um, yeah, that's, that's basically what's called biofringence. And the reason why this is kind of not so nice is shown in, the, in this picture here. So that's uh, one example. It's, it's by focusing. And if I can remind you of this picture I said earlier, you can, you can pick the um, beam radius inside the crystal as a stability criterion versus a pump power. And then you end up with these two pots. And what B focusing means is actually that the position of, um, uh, let's forget about this part because we're not going to work here. It's just not enough pump power to build a high power laser. If you want to build a high power laser, then you're interested in that region. And as you can see, the, the tangential component, the radial component, that's these two curves, they are really far apart, so they barely have any overlap. And that's bad if you want to build a linearly polarized laser, because linearly polarized light uh, consists of these two components, the radial component and the tangential component. And if these two stability ranges don't overlap here, then that basically means that you can't just build a linearly polarized laser. So that's a bad thing that can happen, or that, that actually happens. 
And another effect that happens is um, that this biofringence um, uh, creates a phase shift for the polarization components. And that phase shift depends on the radial um, position. So this ellipse started to, started to uh, turn with respect to the, to, to the position on the, on the crystal surface, actually. What that causes is, um, is depolarization. So that I've got a, um, a CCD image here of depolarized light. So that means actually you, you send in a round, nicely polarized beam, and then uh, you pump the crystal. And behind the crystal, you have some sort of analysis, like a polarizing beam splitter. And if you look at the ports of the beam splitter, then you don't end up with a nice round beam profile anymore, but it looks like that. And uh, I personally think it also looks looks very nice. So if I would have the task to create some artwork, then that would be the best thing I could do. But unfortunately, the LIGO guys asked us to build something with a really nice round beam profile. And um, so we had to put some effort into that. Yeah. Yeah, we do. We do, but you have, you have two effects. So the first effect is that you want to work somewhere here. That's what I, what I talked about in, in the first talk. And I'm going to talk about this uh, again in this talk. But um, it, it doesn't really help you, because if you would have a radially polarized beam, then you could do that. Then you could pick your working point somewhere here, and then you would have the lowest mode with a radially polarization. But we want to have a linearly polarized output, and that's always the composition of these two components. And especially in this first region, there's basically no overlap between these two, two curves. And that's... That, that thing doesn't work because of... Doesn't work. Uh, but luckily, there's a workaround for that. And um, that, that's basically the reason why the, the LIGO laser has an, an even number of crystals. Between, because between each set of crystals, you can build some sort of um, a compensation for these effects. <laughs> And the way it works is that you do an imaging of, the, of two opposing crystals of the, uh, in this case, I, I think I've drawn it right, of the, of the principal plane of the crystal. So you image these two planes. And in between the setup, you rotate the, the polarization of the whole beam by 90 degrees. And what that means is actually that you swap the, the um, uh, radial and the tangential components in the two crystals with respect to each other. So what's a radial component in this? Uh, crystal becomes a tangential component in that crystal because you have this 90 degree rotation in between these two. And that actually um, causes that you re can really compensate for that effect. So that's the beam pattern you get out of the first crystal. So or, or let, let's start here. So you send in a nice round um, uh, uh, mode, which is kind of propagating in some sort of resonator or so. Behind the first crystal, you get this pattern, which I've shown earlier. And then you do this flip of the two, um, two components. You do this imaging properly, and it works almost perfectly. Not 100% not perfectly, because you're always imaging a certain plane here, and there might be some, uh, yeah, some, some divergence of the laser beam inside the crystals. But you end up with a nice round beam profile again. And also, if you look at the um, stability plot here, I normally just do that by doing some ABCD matrix calculation. Um, uh, uh, stuff and um, if you really have two crystals and then you do this calculation with with the two uh, different thermal lenses then you end up with this compensated curve here so that's a, the black curve I added and might be not surprisingly that it's right in the middle between these two regions and um, uh, then you can actually do this trick with this working point right in the beginning here right Um, then let's go on with this <clears throat> point on spherical aberrations and um, th that thing with the stability range. So I, I know that I already talked about it, but I want to go a bit more into the details of that if I can. So, so far we have talked about a, a more or less homogeneously pumped crystal. Um, and um, yeah, as I, as I pointed out earlier, we end up with a radially uh, parabolic temperature profile. So, so far, we were just assuming that there is a normal lens, like the one you can buy from some company, except that that's 
now um, uh, de de dependent on the pump power, on the, on the energy you put into the crystal. However, that is not, not true for the real um, uh, situation. If you have a radially inhomogeneous uh, pump light distribution, um, then, you, then you end up with uh, something around it. So, so you, I mean, the first estimate that you have some sort of lens or so is not completely wrong. But especially in the end regions where you don't have this, where actually the, the temperature goes down and you come close to the cooled barrel of the crystal. Now these assumptions are not really true and you end up with some mainly spherical aberrations. And the reason why they are mainly spherical is everything is kind of, kind of round, kind of symmetrically. It's, it's not totally true because it's kind of tricky to, to have a really homogeneous um, cooling of the crystal. But um, at that point, the, the uh, non-radially um, symmetric uh, things are so small that we, I think we can really ignore that. And again, you can use a, a wavefront sensor to investigate how big these aberrations are. And I, I, and I guess most of you have done that in the lab probably. Um, I think I can skip that because I've already described how that thing works. <clears throat> and what you then do, you want to have a set of orthogonal complete uh, polynomes, basically, or some complete set. And if you pick the Zernike polynomes because they are quite common, you can describe the wavefront as a formula like that. So you basically have a, have a setup, and then you have the sum of all these components, each one with a certain coefficient. And um, yeah, well, then you have odd and, odd and even um, Zernike polynomials. So this is the angular function part here, which is either cosine or sine. And then you have this radial polynomial, which at least I don't know out of my head. So I have then some sort of MATLAB code. And then, um, well, that's a, that's a certain kind of polynomials. And here they are. We already talked about the defocus term. Then you normally have, or, or quite often have, some terms which are not radially symmetric. So if you, for example, tip and tilt, then that might indicate that you want to tip or tilt your, your sensor a little bit if you know that your setup is more or less radially symmetric to get rid of these com com components. And then there are a bunch of other components, so that, that of course goes further down here. And we're actually interested in the, in the uh, radially symmetric um, uh, part. So I already talked about the defocus term that can be used to investigate the thermal lens. And the next interesting term is actually the, the spherical aberrations. <coughs> and if I come along again with this setup, so I've shown you that before. I send a test laser through a pumped crystal. And then I look not only at the defocus term, but also at all the other terms. Then I might end up with a graph like that. And I apologize for the bad. Uh, actually, it's not too bad. On my, uh, on my laptop, it looks much worse, this picture. <laughs> Don't know why that is. But if you do this, um, th this uh, division into, into certain polynomials, uh, polynomials for the picture you, you get here. And you can look what happened at different pump powers for a certain setup. And this is not a really, really nice graph. So w what you expect to see is that at zero pump power, you have about, so that's this black dots here. So all the polynomials are set to zero. And the reason for that is that you always need some sort of reference where you kind of refer to. So and the software I used had a little knob. So I put that that uh, my test beam in, pressed that knob, and said, OK, this is my reference plane, so all the, all the components should be 0. And if you th then rise the pump power, then you would expect that the higher the pump power is, the more aberrations, or, yeah, the more aberrations you get. And that's kind of true, not completely. So especially this red dot here at low pump power, it's kind of, well, it gives you the highest readout here in the, in the tilt. So that's tip and tilt, these two components. And I guess they could be aligned by just tilting the, the, the wavefront sensor. But it also gives you the, the, the highest number, for example, for the astigmatism and also for, for the offset and so on. So that's a bit surprising. But overall, if you look at the data, then you can see that the, um, that the terms are growing if the pump power rises. Um, well, and what, you, what, what I would expect, at least, is that the defocus term would 
be the biggest one, which is not quite the case here. And the, the next higher one I would expect to be the spherical aberrations, which is yeah, also not, not really the case here. But OK, I, I think you get the idea on how, how that works. So what you could then do is you could grab these um, coefficients for, for a certain, uh, uh, certain setup, put it into some simulation, and the simulation and then look what the simulation gives you as a beam profile. And I did that. There's a nice little program called GLAD. It's, um, I, I think there's a freeware trial version somewhere on the web. And the nice thing with this program is that it's actually capable to calculate with gain or so. So you can really simulate a resonator. You say, OK, we start, up, we start with some sort of um, uh, a Gaussian beam. And we assume that there are some crystals which have some gain and which have some um, so some of these uh, um, uh, aberrations here, so I put all these nickel coefficients in, and then you look what's coupled out through a certain output coupler, and then you can compare that with the data. And that program, maybe I should note that down. It's a bit complicated to handle because you kind of have to invent your own programming language, but there is a, oh, uh, I think I pressed uh, that. So if you Google for that, it's not very expensive, but you can get a trial version, and um, it has a has a couple of lines of um, of freeware code, and also some nice examples. <clears throat> However, what what you what you could do if you want to get an idea on the on the aberrations, and I, I'm talking about spherical aberrations from now on, is you can see what happens if I have uh, several pump light distributions. So how does the thermal lens kind of, um, uh, um, how does it appear? And uh, I'm talking about this integrated uh, pump spot I was trying to introduce yesterday. So I'm, if, if, I, if I say pump spot, it's a bit hard to see, but I, I have an example of three different spots. And that's all these integrated pump spots which had been measured with this fancy device I've, I've shown yesterday. And these two, these three uh, examples look kind of different. So this one, for example, has a, has a certain offset. That's a blue curve, has a high peak in the middle, and then it's falling down here. So that indicates that you absorb a lot of, uh, or that this, the real spot of your pump light is somewhere in the beginning of the crystal. This one is very wide, so that doesn't necessarily mean that you really have a wide pump spot, but a main part of the absorption occurs where the, where the, the cross section is big. And what happens is, if you look at the thermal refractive power for these uh, three different curves, so that's the solid lines here, then you would see the bigger the laser mode is, and you can either simulate that or you can actually uh, change the laser mode size by changing the long resonator arm, as I pointed out earlier. So the long resonator arm in an asymmetric resonator sets uh, the um, uh, radius of the, um, of the beam. The bigger that beam is, the lower is the th thermal lens, and that's not really surprising if you have if you look at this pump light distribution, and you have a you have a beam which is somewhere here in the middle, then you have a big effect. But if you integrate over a large region here, then you could estimate that the that the integral over that is kind of smaller, so the thermal lens effect is smaller. But the cost for that is that the uh, that the spherical aberrations, and that's what's shown with these dotted lines here they grow because here in the middle you or maybe I should pick this one you still have kind of a parabolic shape of the of, of the pump light of the temperature distribution of the refractive index but here at the end you normally have these wings so if you have a big uh, big beam here then these wings play a certain role and they they actually cause these aberrations and then the question rises okay how many aberrations do you want and then I did this experiment picked a, a certain setup, picked a certain um, amount of spherical aberrations, which I've calculated here. Actually, that's a change of the, of the beam size. And um, then I, I, I try to adjust the short resonator arm, which actually gives you the position of that stability pot such that at about the same pump power, you end up with a fundamental mode. And all these three pictures, so they, they're all pumped with around 130 watts with a certain resonator configuration. They are all built such that I end up with a, with a fundamental mode beam. But the output power is different in every case. And as you can see, 
this one apparently is, is way too big for the crystal, so that's a kind of a, a huge mode. So you get this, well, I, I guess it's a diffraction pattern. And also you might cut away something because the output power of this um, whole thing is rather low compared to, for example, this data point. So the question is still, <clears throat> or let me, well, that's kind of a reminder. I, I, I sort of hope that you still have this picture in mind. So uh, if you have a, um, just to remind you, because I, I want to I wanna use this picture in the, in the following slides. Uh, if you have a, a symmetric a resonator, two head or four head, then you would end up with this blue stability range. If you change the long resonator arm, that means that you make the mode bigger and that you also get the split between the, the two ranges. And if you do something with the short resonator arm, then that moves around this uh, second stability port, which we are actually interested in. Okay, so to summarize that, um, we can say, okay, the, the, the bigger the laser mode is, the lower is the thermal lens, so we have to do something with the short resonator arm, but the bigger are the spherical aberrations. And um, what, what follows from that is that higher order modes usually have a, or they, they all have a bigger diameter than the fundamental modes. And what that means, if, if you take that thing that I said before, and the fact that the higher order modes have a bigger diameter, is that they see a different thermal lens. And that means actually that for higher order modes, the, um, the second stability port appears at a different position. It appears at a higher pump power because you need more pump power, more heat generation to create the same effect, actually. And um, that really works out. So this is a picture uh, we took from, from the PSL, actually. And um, well, that's the overall pump power for all four crystals. And um, I think I've shown you a similar picture before. So here's the rod radius. It's a three millimeter diameter crystal. And the working point would be somewhere in this region. And the red curves are all the higher order modes, which are actually shifted to higher pump powers. So if you, if you look at this working point, you, then you might end up with a nice round beam profile. If you look at, at higher pump powers, then you would end up with different beam profiles, so more modes appear. If you look way out here, then you have different patterns, like an overlap of different higher order modes, and then the lower, lowest order mode, the TM00, which we are interested in, might disappear. In the region in between, you, you usually get something like that, which is some sort of fluorescence, but there's not no really laser. Um, Both, actually. So it, it, the, the amount of, of um, uh, thermal refractive power that you have depends on the size of the laser mode. The bigger the laser mode is at a certain pump power, the less thermal lensing it sees, because you have these wings in the end where the lens effect is kind of moderate and you sort of integrate over the beam profile. On yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, you have you have a um, <clears throat> you have a pump light spot which sort of looks like that maybe, and then you have a, then you have a, a laser mode which sort of uh, overlaps like that. Okay, so in this region you have you have a more or less uh, high thermal thing. But if you have a bigger laser mode, which uh, sort of looks like that or so, then you have to integrate over this whole thing. So the overall heat generation is, is lower in the wings here than it is in the middle. And that means that for bigger laser modes, you see a, a smaller thermal lens. So if you make the, either the fundamental mode bigger, then that mode would see um, a weaker thermal lens. Or you have a, a bigger mode in general, like a higher order mode. Oh, you mean if you have some effect due to the fact that there is some, some gain stolen or so, some, la some sort of laser cooling or something? 
I haven't really investigated that, but um, actually I, I don't even know in which direction it goes. I could imagine that, okay, you have a certain gain, and now there's a laser oscillating, so that eats some of the gain, because that's how, how a laser works, so that's some cooling effect, and that means that the, that the thermal lens is getting um, smaller if the laser is running, as if you're just using a test beam. Oh, not necessarily. It could also increase, right? I mean, the laser beam. Right. Yeah, you don't have right. You don't have the you, you don't have the situation where where you have a let's let's say you have a for the lowest order mode you have this as a pump light profile and then you have this Gaussian overlap and for a bigger mode for a bigger laser mode a multi-mode laser you would have a, a different pump light profile. Instead, it's the same pump light profile but with these wings. So the effect in these wings here is lower than what you see in the middle. So the most heat is generated in the middle of the crystal at the optical axis. That's kind of so, so, so you assume always the same pump light distribution, no matter how the laser mode looks like. But it affects the laser mode different. Sure. Yeah, actually, actually, in all the simulations I'm showing, I'm assuming that the uh, that the thermal lens is always the same. Doesn't matter whether laser uh, radiation occurs or no, and it doesn't really matter whether it's a multi-mode or a single-mode laser. I just keep that as a lens for the time being, and I'm not assuming that there is um, an absorption actually happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So figure out that we can just ignore it. Does that kind of answer the question or? Yeah, sure. Okay. So there's still the question, uh, what's the optimal configuration of the arm length? And um, I've, I made this little plot where I actually picked a certain arm length of the long resonator arm and, uh, and then changed the short resonator arm length. And then I looked at the output power. So that's this, what this color code here is. And then I moved on for another long arm length and another short arm length and so on. And if you do that, then you really find out if you have the short resonator arm length fixed at, let's say, 130 or 140 millimeters or so, and then you play around with the long resonator arm, then in fact you, you always have this TM00 operation. So that's what this black curve here is. You always have a TM00, and that's obvious from the stability diagrams I've shown. Because what the short resonator arm would do it would be it, it would shift the second stability pot around. But I'm not doing that. I'm holding that steady, and I'm just moving the long resonator arm. So all I'm doing here is changing the mode size inside the crystal. And in fact, at all these points, roughly, I mean, it's a roughly vertical uh, horizontal line. You see the, the fundamental mode operation. And what you also see is that you always get roughly the same output power. So this curve here moves along at this yellow greenish region. So what, what happens on the other hand if you have a fixed long resonator arm length and then you change the short resonator arm, the longer you, you, you make it, the longer you uh, um, uh, make the short resonator arm, so the more symmetric that system becomes, the more output power you can generate, which you would think, well, that's a, that's a great thing for the LIGO laser, right? We just generate a, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure that I can build a 300 watt laser but the problem with that is that the beam profile will not be no longer round here. So that does not really help. So that gives you a first clue on <laughs> what's going on here. But there's still the question, okay, if that's, if I, now I've set my short resonator arm length, how do I set this resonator arm length? So how do I know which, which of these points I want to pick? It's roughly the same output power. It's all fundamental mode. Um, <clears throat> So let's have a look at the beam profile. And if you do that, 
um, I'm sorry, I've, I've, I've forgotten to remove this German phrases here. So, uh, but 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 the point is, um, the, the short resonator arm length is fixed. The long resonator arm length is changed. And then I looked at the beam profile, and this um, this phrase here actually says it's the white curve shows you the cut through this region. So I picked the data points here and then sort of plotted them. And it turns out the longer you make the long resonator arm, the more of these um, rings occur around the beam profile. And you see it's not only one ring. If you, if you make it even longer, then a second ring appears and, and so on. So that indicates that the beam inside the laser crystal is already too big. My suspicion would be that these are refraction rings that you just see because uh, yeah, the, the laser mode is slightly too big for the crystal. And so you, you, you probably rather want to work somewhere in that region, maybe even a bit further here because you want to have a big overlap between the fundamental mode and the pump light to generate as much light as you, as you can. But you certainly don't, don't want to work in this region here because there you have all this ring and that's something you can't use for the LIGO interferometer. So you probably want to pick, pick a point somewhere here. And in fact, we did. If you remember, we have this corona aperture at the exit of the laser box. And, and um, the length is picked such that we have an optimum between the, the output power, so a good overlap between the pump light and the laser mode on the one hand. And on the other hand, we are cutting away something like 20 watts or so. But it's still better than the situation here. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, and here's the proof of concept again. I think I've shown that graph before. Uh, if you look at the output power with respect to the pump power, then you uh, end up with the first stability range, which is not really useful here because the output power is rather low. And in the beginning of the second stability range, you have this um, nice round beam profile. The interesting part is that at this point, also the power fluctuations are rather low. And the reason is that you basically don't have any mode competition. So that's a nice thing with the fundamental mode, because with all higher order modes which might occur here, you have at least one mode more. So at, if you go to slightly higher pump powers, then you would end up with a beam profile, which consists of fundamental still, because its stability range is still available. But also the next higher order modes appear. And so these modes start to compete. And that causes some power fluctuation. So this curve would grow up here. And on this side, of course, these high fluctuations are caused because uh, yeah, the, the laser sort of can't really decide whether it wants to laser or not. So it, it starts and it eats all the gain, then it turns off again, and so on. So uh, that's really the point where you are very close to the optimum of power fluctuations. And in fact, at the free-running uh, LIGO laser, we have fluctuations in the, in the region of about 5 to 6% or so. so. Yes? Yes. This one? I, I think it's, it's mode competition. However, um, the, uh, <laughs> I, I tried to cheat a bit. So the, the really lowest point is actually this one. And that's, uh, that's what we call a donut mode. So that's this kind of uh, ring that we have. <clears throat> and that always turns out to be the easiest. So that's always a mode which actually wants to oscillate in the oscillator. It gives a lot of output power. It's very clean. It's very quiet. But uh, again, I mean, uh, we were not asked to do some art. It, it looks actually kind of nice. We want to have this round beam profile. So it's, it's slightly worse in this point, to be honest. But the DN, DNDT? Oh, it's, um, um, uh, okay. If you have an asymmetric um, resonator like that, uh, that's L1 and that's L2 asymmetric. And G1 is um, for this setup. So it's not true for all lasers. But for this setup, it would be 1 minus um, L2 divided by F. 
and G2 would be 1 minus L1 divided by F. <coughs> and that whole thing is stable if uh, the product of the two uh, is between 0 and 1. I think that's how it, how it goes. I mean, uh, it might be that I made a mistake, but I think I'm right with this. So um, if, if, um, if, if you don't have any pump power, then this is infinite. So you end up with a 1 for G1, same for G2. So then the product is 1, and then you're, yeah, then you're right at the edge of this uh, pot. So I think it's right like this. <coughs> Okay, uh, did I skip a slide? No. Okay, so yeah, that's uh, just briefly. Um, turned out that that can be uh, th that this system can be uh, scaled. So I have a bunch of points here. I increase the pump power. Of course, that means that the stability pot sort of moves. So I have to adjust the short resonator arm length, and then I end up with more output power. And there are per data uh, per, per pump power there are more than one data point because I was playing around a bit with the resonator arm length and tried to figure out what the optimum is. So, but the basic message here is um, the output power is still scalable and that was in the end the trick on how we got the, the 200 watt laser. <clears throat> I mean in the beginning we thought okay let's work at 200 watts of pump power because that's kind of an optimum with a decreased pump power for the diet so the, the pump diets are not working at their maximum capacity just to have some range in both directions. And we increase this number a bit because we want to have a two-head system in this case which can create something like 80 watts or so. so we double the number of crystals and we would end up with 160. And then we would add the 35 watts from the, from the uh, master oscillator power amplifier. So then we add something like 195. And if we then optimize the output coupler a bit, then that would give us a 200 watt laser. So that was the magic number we were always uh, aiming for. Um, okay, so how much time do I have? Can I talk a bit about? Oh, okay. So then I, I guess I um, maybe I just leave it with this slide and just give you an idea. So uh, we we tried to do some optimization. One is we used um, higher doping concentration, and the reason for that is that at low doped crystals they're really kind of hard to manufacture with an with a with a with an equal quality. <clears throat> so you always end up with some error. So you can only specify, okay, we want to have 0.1 atomic percent doped crystals and uh, we want these crystals to uh, to be within a certain stabi um, a certain uncertainty. And that's normally not a percentage number but an absolute number. And that absolute number is the same for all the crystals. So if you would have the chance to get a higher dope crystals, then those won't even, won't not only be more common, you would also make a smaller percentage uh, error. So we thought, okay, let's buy highly doped crystals and don't pump them at the absorption maximum, but at some other point somewhere where the absorption is a bit lower. And maybe that sort of works out. And what was coming out of that was actually, um, we use exactly the same setup with higher dope crystals or with lower dope crystals, then, we, then we've seen that we can't really do that. So we end up with a, high, high, uh, with a highly multi-mode beam and the TM00 mode occurs at lower pump powers. So what one has to do is then one has to adjust the short resonator arm length a bit. And then it's possible to bring that back to the, uh, to the working point. And the lesson we learned from that was actually that um, we have to take into account that the higher the doping concentration of the crystal is, the, the worse it gets uh, in terms of the thermal uh, things that we observe. So the higher is the heat fraction that we extract from the crystal. So yeah, that was the lesson we learned from that. We played around with segmented crystals because I told you that we tried to have an, have an even temperature distribution within the crystal. And um, to, make it, uh, to make it as even as possible, you basically want to have a hyperbolic doping uh, uh, profile. So you want to have low absorption where a lot of pump light is available and high absorption in the end where, where you don't have that much pump light. 
and that would give you an even um, uh, temperature distribution and that could be uh, I mean it, it, it's kind of hard to build these uh, build these um, hyperbolically doped crystals I'm just about to learn that probably people who build the uh, ceramic laser crystals can do that they can probably pick something like that but it's still kind of complicated so to narrow that down you can use crystals with dif different segments of different um, doping concentrations and then get rid of the pump light double pass because the pump light double pass is kind of bad if you're not right at the absor absorption maximum so if you for example in the middle of heating up the pump diodes and then you're not at the absorption peak but somewhere where no absorption occurs then all the pump light is going into the crystal is reflected at the end phase and then reflected back to the pump diode or the fibers and that might really cause some damage so that was uh, also successful, but these crystals are uh, rather expensive, and the output power that one can generate from these crystals is about the same. And then the third point uh, I can uh, I was going to talk about is um, <clears throat> actually we we wanted to try to get rid of this uh, biofringence compensation here because it turns out that these quartz rotators can't be made with a really great precision you always have some absorption in that material the coating is not that great and I also have some data which show if you don't uh, align this properly so if you tilt it for example by something like two degrees or so then the rotation is no longer 90 degrees it's only something like 80 and then you would end up with some depolarization effects and that's kind of bad I mean we can monitor that but it can always be that something shifts and then that whole thing would be misaligned and the output power would lower, be lower and so on so a workaround might be to use this um, uh, a, a different crystal cut because it turns out that the depolarization which is basically a material property um, changes with a crystallographic cut direction and that's kind of an image so the, if you just order a neodymium yak crystal somewhere then it's normally cut in this direction with a certain depolarization but uh, you can also try to get crystals with different cut directions and then the de depolarization depends on the orientation of the crystal with respect to the linearly polarized laser light and that's kind of what is shown with these um, these arrows here so that this is particularly interesting because there you have almost no depolarization at a certain pump power this one is in this case worse but um, uh, I learned that it's getting better if the pump power is increased so if you would have something like a kilowatt pump power per crystal and this one in fact is the best now that's kind of the effect so we played around again with the test beam we were rotating the crystal so maybe just roughly in the normal situation you have this dip, um, depolarization pattern which basically just rotates if you rotate either the crystal or the polarization of the beam but if you have different crystals and you see that this pattern not only rotates it looks quite slightly different and it doesn't only rotate it also changes its, its shape so that can you can try to optimize that and then try to minimize the depolarization as I said for low pump powers this crystal cut here is by far the worst because at a certain orientation you get even some depolarization at the center of the crystal which is not the case for these crystals so they would you would expect really high losses with that of course we also did some experiments in this two head as a as a stage before the forehead laser um, in this case we rotated the the crystal itself with this goniometer table here of course if you put a quartz rotator in then you can always reproduce a simple case if you don't have the quartz rotator then you might end up with beam profiles which kind of look like that so in the in the normal crystal cut um, in the 111 case you can't do that you can't create a round beam profile so that's a consequence of this separation between the the two stability ports for the radial and the tangential component for the other uh, two crystals it's kind of possible so this is a bit elliptically and this cut here it, it's actually not too bad but you have huge depolarization losses due to the fact that you have this high depolarization in the middle of the crystal so um, you want I can comment on, on on these slides a bit later but um, I think I'm out of time so thanks
Uh, I can't. I mean, I, I, I don't have to take the deformation of the crystal surface into account because we have this undoped end caps actually on both sides. So we have that not only on the pump side, but also on the side where the reflection um, occurs. <clears throat> and uh, I don't really know how to distinguish that. So I would try to do that optically, to look at the surface with some sort of test beam in a certain angle and then try to try to see that. So I would probably use a wavelength where the surface coating is highly reflective and then try to investigate some sort of setup. Um, but with the methods I've shown here, um, you can't. Plus the lens somewhere there. What you measure here is a totally integrated thermal lens. Yes. Both with the profile and the deformation. Well, yeah. If this includes the sum of both of them. Yes. Right. But the deformation will not be dependent on the power of the laser. So. It will. It will because the more, the more, you mean the, the power of the laser or the power of the. Uh, the power of the laser. Yeah, but both don't. I mean, also the, the thermal effect, the, the internal effect, not the bulging of the end phases, that also um, doesn't depend on the laser power. I mean, not in first order. I mean, I, I would rather be a bit careful. I mean, there might be some cooling effects or maybe heating effects be involved, but in first order, I would assume that both effects don't de depend on the power of the laser itself. By fringes will only depend on the polarization, I mean, uh, change of refractive index, not the heat effect. Um, the depolarization yeah, that you're getting due to higher fringes. That's actually true. That might so it be will only depend on the uh, refractive index, not on the deformation. So yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting idea. So that might be a yeah, that might be a simple thing to see how much the end phases change. Yeah. That's a good thing. Are you so using a folded cavity somewhere in the uh, amplifier stage? The, what, the Are you using folded cavity rather than a linear cavity in your amplifier stage? Um, yeah, some of these pictures, uh, yeah, actually I mix it a bit up. So the, the, these pictures I've shown uh, with this uh, yellow, with this um, black and red stability points and so on, that was a calculation for the uh, forehead. Uh, folded cavity. Folded cavity. Oh, folded, no. no, no. We always use linear cavities. I mean, uh, we had a folded setup in the very beginning, in the very early days of the laser development. But um, that means that you have at least one additional mirror, and we try to avoid that. We, you always want to try to have as less optical components so as possible. All your simulations, you are uh, uh, dealing with it. Uh, you are not. You, you did not consider the tangential and sagittal components. Rather, you are working with the radial and tangential. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the simulations I did, that's all ABCD matrix calculations. So I just put the four crystals in, and I don't take the mirrors into account. It's just, uh, it's, it's basically four ABCD matrices, all with a certain thermal lens, and no other components. So, but I mean, in, in, in practice, it's a bit hard. I mean, this, this LIGO laser, it's four crystals, it's a bunch of mirrors, each one has certain degrees of freedom, and you have this 4F imaging, you have the quartz retainer, so that's already something like 100 degrees of freedom or so or more. It's already sort of complicated to do it in initial alignment, so you want to avoid to have some folding mirrors inside or so. So the tangential and sagittal stabilities are the same? Yeah. Uh, so other, other than this uh, two meter snake, uh, for compensation, um, is there any other technique uh, which, which is used yeah. for compensating this crystal thermal lens? Um, uh, uh, yeah, you mean for the depolarization compensation? No, uh, just for thermal lens. Thermal lens. Well, you can try to use a lens with a concave lens and try to put it somewhere into the resonator. But that would even nail your working point down more because that thermal lens really has to have a, have the same focal length as, as the lens you're working with. So that would really nail down your um, your uh, beam size inside the crystal and also the amount of pump power. So you would lose a lot of flexibility. The other thing which I don't know would work on or no would be you could do the same thing as in the Faraday isolator. It has a KT crystal which absorbs absorbs a, a slightly tiny little bit of the pump of, of, of the laser light and creates a negative thermal lens. So there are materials available which apparently can do 
learns. You can try to play around with that, but um, again, I think it's, it's going to be expensive. It would nail down your working point even more than it is already than it already is. I mean, uh, this is actually kind of bad already because what you normally want to use for the intensity stabilization, and I'm going to comment on that, um, uh, I think tomorrow is you might want to modulate your, your pump current and you want to have a linear uh, relationship between the, the, the pump light, the amount of pump light, and the amount of laser light that's coming out. But with this setup, that's just not possible because if you move the, the, the amount of pump light in one direction, then the laser will turn off. In the other direction, it, it will increase, but also higher order modes will appear. So that's already kind of, uh, yeah, I mean, it, I would, I would say it's a smart design, but in terms of uh, you just quickly want to get like five watts more out of that system, it's not that easy. You also have to modify the resonator. So uh, I think it's close to the best way you can do it. Can you use this method to look at uh, reflection spectrum change for a mirror, coated mirror, because of its high pump power? thermal creation on the mirror. Well, the and suppose I want to characterize what is the reflectivity of this as a function of pump power. Can I use this method that you have described? Um, and if, so if, if you have a coating which is, which is kind of made such that you're right at the, at, at the edge of this coating, so if you want to investigate something which is, let's say, close to uh, HR coating at 1064 nanometers, and you don't put you don't design your coating such that you're kind of in the middle of a pot. So it doesn't matter whether you have 1063.5 or 1065 or so, uh, but you're somehow on the edge, then I think you would see some effects. Yeah. So can you comment on the sensitivity? Can we continue our coffee? So we come back at 11.